I'm Paris Schutz. Thanks for joining us on this Tuesday, October 29th. Coming up on Chicago Tonight, former FBI Director James Comey visits Chicago. The future look of the Obama Presidential Center. Catching up with actor John Leguizamo in town for a new one-man show. And giant pumpkins, some as heavy as 1,500 pounds. But first, within the last hour, a crucial committee of the Chicago Teachers Union met at CTU headquarters. The 700-member House of Delegates has the authority to agree to a tentative agreement and end the strike. But will members vote to do so? Brandis Friedman joins us from outside CTU headquarters with more. Brandis. In Paris, that meeting is still going on, and I'm sure the city will make it official shortly about whether or not classes are indeed canceled for tomorrow. Um, but as of now, I'm hearing from at least one delegate inside this building that they expect to be on the picket lines tomorrow. Uh, we are told that they did not take a vote here tonight. Um, and heading into this meeting, you know, CTU has repeatedly said that this meeting is not necessarily to take a vote, that it is actually to inform the members on the status of bargaining and talk about the path towards what they call, quote, a just contract. Contract. The union even accuses the mayor and the district of being misleading by sending out a ro robocall to parents and taxpayers earlier this evening. That robocall said that the House of Delegates would be meeting tonight to take a vote um, and that they might vote on whether or not to end the strike. But, you know, just less than two hours ago, the mayor and Janice Jackson were expressing some frustration that CTU leadership is hung up on a few non-monetary issues at this point, among them some new political demands. And the mayor said the same thing to us uh, to reporters earlier today she says the union is asking her to support an elected school board bill in Springfield one that she has already publicly rejected are we really keeping our kids out of class unless I agree to support the CTU's full political agenda wholesale if the CTU wants a deal there's a deal to be had right now on the table it's an excellent offer that will bring unprecedented equity focus investments to our school system. But it's time to move forward towards a resolution and stop throwing more items at the wall at the 11th hour. This is no longer about money. This is about the political issues that Mayor Lightfoot outlined in her speech and a, a last minute grab to take away precious instructional time that our students need and we have seen tremendous academic gains as a result of. Now, the city and the district are asking parents and taxpayers to take a look for themselves at the offer that they have made to CTU. Uh, there will be uh, uh, that'll be available on our website as well as CPS's website. The other hold up, the mayor says, is the union is demanding uh, that they amend a clause in the contract that would change the issues over which the union can strike. Um, and rather than holding picket lines this morning at schools, the union held one mass rally at the Lincoln Yards development in Lincoln Park. They are again making the argument that more than a billion dollars of the TIF money being used for that six billion dollar development they say that should be used to pay for the schools later on more demonstrators sat in at the Sterling Bay offices in Fulton Market and blocked the doors Chicago police say nine people were arrested there for refusing to leave if we don't get it shut it down whose city our city whose school our school now, we are hoping, of course, to hear from someone from CTU here. Uh, we're expecting to hear from them after uh, after that meeting. We'll bring that to you uh, once we know uh, when that's happening. But, you know, meanwhile, the people that this is arguably affecting the most would be the students. High schools were slated to give the PSAT test tomorrow. We'll have more information on that in a second. Um, and Friday is the deadline to apply for early admission or early action at many colleges and universities. We caught up with some students getting help with their college essays from the College Advising Corps Office of the University of Chicago. They were working at the Chinatown branch of the Chicago Public Library. I kind of see there's like two sides to it. There are some issues like you need to talk with teachers about recommendations and the online submitting of stuff that would be helpful if there was school, but then also have less time to write essays and stuff like that yeah, if there weren't the strike. So it's kind of like losing some stuff, getting some stuff though. Teachers definitely um, need to get what they deserve and will. Most of it is for us anyway, and I just feel like I'm really behind in school. And like, since this is a year wide, like we do testing and stuff like that, it's what I'm really worried about. 
Now that PSAT test that was scheduled for tomorrow, that was a reschedule from October 16th. That's uh, the day before the strike began. Just a few minutes ago, we also uh, learned in a tweet from Chicago Public Schools that even if classes do resume tomorrow, they will still not give that test to students just to be sure that they have the optimal testing conditions and that they're not arriving back after a nine day strike and being given a standardized test. Uh, the Ma National Merit Scholarship Organization, we are told, will use the juniors April test scores and for eighth and ninth graders that test will be rescheduled for another time. Uh, meanwhile, some schools, University of Chicago, for example, they've extended the deadline uh, for Chicago Public Schools students um, instead of it being this Friday, November 1st for them to get in their early application materials. Meanwhile, Paris, we are still waiting to hear from Chicago Public Schools about the cancellation of classes. They are waiting to hear from CTU um, about what happens inside this House of Delegates meeting. So for now, we'll send it back to you. All right, Brand, it's a lot of moving parts. Thank you so much. And fired former FBI director James Comey was in Chicago today. This one day after the person who fired him, President Donald Trump, spoke in Chicago at a Chiefs of Police conference. Comey served as Deputy Attorney General under former President George W. Bush and as FBI director from 2013 to 2017. He gave remarks on leadership at his alma mater, the University of Chicago Law School, and did not hold back his opinions about the current occupant of the Oval Office. This leader doesn't know anything about leadership. Comey told the assembled law students that he would devote his current public platform to speaking about the qualities of effective leadership. He believes one of his bosses displayed them and the other did not. I found President Obama to be an extraordinarily confident person, confident enough to be quiet and to take those chances, and his success with the polar opposite, deeply insecure. The former FBI director recounted how he found out he was fired by President Trump while on a recruitment trip to Los Angeles. And then I looked up, and on the television screens, I saw right in front of me in big letters, Comey resigns. <laughs> Comey has received criticism from the current Attorney General, William Barr, for what Barr referred to as a, quote, lack of leadership. And he's frequently been the subject of scorn from President Trump. Barr is currently overseeing what has been reported as a criminal probe into the origins of the investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 elections, of which Comey played a key role. Comey did not address that, but scoffed at the notion that there exists a deep state of intelligence bureaucrats in Washington out to get the president. There's no deep state in the United States, except in this sense. There's a deep culture. In the intelligence community, the military community, the civil service, the law enforcement community that goes into bed, which is the rule of law matters, a political exercise of power matters, and the truth matters. Comey defended his handling of an investigation into Hillary Clinton's email server, noting that the announcement to congressional leaders that he had reopened the investigation came three years ago this week. As painful as it is, I actually still feel comfortable with that decision. I wish to God we hadn't been involved. People ask me if you could change anything. If I could change anything, I wouldn't have been, it had nothing to do with it. But we have something to do with it, and we're faced with a decision that's excruciating, and both options are bad. Comey's speech was noted for the optimism that he expressed, saying he feels the Trump era could serve to remind citizens of different political ideologies that their political differences are small in the grand scheme of things. I think that's kind of refreshing to hear from somebody that was involved at such a, a high level. Um, I think uh, in uh, many of my conversations around here, people get pretty downbeat uh, often, um, you know, just with uh, everything that's in the news. So uh, that was kind of good to hear, I guess. Comey did not field any questions from reporters in attendance and again did not address whether or not he is a subject of the reported federal criminal probe into the origins of the Russia investigation. And now we turn to Springfield, where a bribery charge against a state lawmaker overshadows the fall veto session. So how is the scandal impacting potential legislation, as well as Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot's legislative priorities? Joining us from Springfield is Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky. Amanda, what is the fallout today from this federal indictment? Paris, the wheels are in motion to remove Representative Luis Arroyo from office. He's charged with one count of federal bribery, bribery that is, prosecutors alleging that Arroyo, a Democrat from Chicago who's risen in the ranks since he became a member of the Illinois House in 2006, arranged to have kickbacks paid to a state senator in, a rain, in exchange for that senator advancing and sponsoring legislation. That senator 
in fact, had actually been working with the federal government as an informant and was wearing a wire that purportedly recorded Arroyo giving him that first bribery check. Now, Arroyo was not in Springfield today to answer questions from reporters or from many of his angry and bothered peers, but right away, Republicans had moved to begin the process to formally investigate Arroyo and today. Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan, a Democrat previously in that regard allied with Arroyo, filed paperwork to get that started. You're going to have three Democratic representatives and then three GOP representatives on Friday meet in a newly formed investigative committee that will look into Arroyo and could end up kicking him out essentially of the Illinois House. There is still pressure, however, to do more on the ethics front. House Republicans seeking to ban lawmakers from also being able to lobby and get paid to lobby municipalities. That's because Arroyo had been paid by a sweepstakes company to lobby the city of Chicago, and this alleged bribery scheme would have benefited that industry. Obviously, someone who's a, who's a member of the General Assembly carries a different weight when talking to a local official about uh, an action that they'd like to have taken on their behalf. There are also calls for, as I noted, more on ethics, and there is going to, it seems, be a committee formed that will look more broadly at what can be done, given that it is not just a royal. There is a lot of investigations, or at least allegations, of corruption right now. State Senator Marty Sandoval, another Chicago Democrat, has not actually been charged. Nor has he, however, spoken in public since his offices were raided in mid-September. He was not here at all this week for the two days that have been in thus far of the veto session. Now, State Senator Tom Collerton, also a Democrat, has been here for the veto session. He has pleaded not guilty to embezzlement charges. Some legislators are also calling for them to be removed from office, but others are sticking by them, given the particular circumstances of each of those cases, and Sandoval's case that he hasn't, again, actually been charged. Amanda, in the Arroyo case, uh, the Sun-Times and Tribune are reporting that an unnamed state senator who served as the FBI's mole is Terry Link. Is that correct? Terry Link, a Waukegan Democrat. Now, those papers, Paris, wouldn't be reporting it unless they had a strong source and reason to do so. And the criminal complaint really does give some clues that make it look like it would be Link. But Link has vehemently denied it. I talked with him today. He said it's the people in his district who elected him. He's received messages from constituents who are wishing him the best and telling him to continue to do his job. And he says that is who he is here working for. Nonetheless, there is a sort of unease here in the Capitol amongst lobbyists, some legislators who might be wary to work and to negotiate with Link, given the fear that perhaps he had been wearing a wire, it seems, not only with Arroyo, but back in 2016 as well. Now, all of this could really hinder Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot's chances of getting a law passed that would allow her to move forward with a Chicago casino. That's because Link has been the point person on gambling legislation. Link told me that anyone who buys into that line of thinking presumes that he was involved with the Arroyo situation. He said, quote, I haven't been accused of a thing, period, zero, nothing, he said. And if he were, he said, or whoever the informant was, there's been no arrest. I'm not charged with anything, he told me this afternoon. In fact, Link actually said that there is a deal, at least on the broad principles for that Chicago casino, something that would lower the tax structure for not only the Chicago casino, but other existing casinos as well. Link called it a win-win situation. I have not, however, despite requests, heard back from the governor's or mayor's offices on that. Man, of course, there's other items on the mayor's wish list in Springfield, including things that would help plug the city's budget deficit. What about some of those other items on the mayor's agenda? 
So right there, she's asking for a state law that would give the Chicago City Council permission that it, it needs, otherwise it can't go forward, to enact a graduated real estate transfer tax. Basically, this is something that would allow her to lower a tax on homes that are under half a million dollars when those are sold, but over $500,000 or luxury homes, she wants to increase the real estate tax when there are those sales. She's facing trouble there too, though. Today, 13 Chicago Democrats coming out against her plan as is. They released a letter that says unless Mayor Lightfoot agrees to spend 60% of the money from that tax to reduce homelessness, that they are going to vote no. It is our intention to support your proposed real estate transfer tax increase only if a significant amount is statutorily dedicated to homelessness, and we believe that at least 60% should go to that purpose. Mayor Lightfoot immediately rejecting the idea. And we've got to be realistic about managing taxpayer dollars in a responsible way, and 60% um, of a dedicated stream in perpetuity is not responsible, given what our other budget stresses are. But given Republican opposition to that plan, she is going to need buy-in from all Chicago Democrats, all Democrats, really, if she is going to get that measure passed in short order. And if she doesn't, well, then she'll have a hole in her proposed city budget. Paris, back to you. That seems to be pretty tricky there, Amanda. Thank you very much. And up next, the latest on the Obama Presidential Center in Jackson Park. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by North Shore University Health System. Here's to the end of illness and the beginning of how healthcare should be. At North Shore, we're transforming your healthcare by analyzing your DNA to identify future health risks for you and working to stop illness before it begins. When you're a North Shore patient, your advanced primary care physician makes the latest genetic science part of your everyday care to keep you healthier longer. Advanced Primary Care. Here's to taking control of your health and taking on what's next. Both former President Barack and former First Lady Michelle Obama spoke at an Obama Foundation Summit event today about, among other things, the future of the former First Family's Presidential Center. So the vision for this isn't just about the Obama Presidential Center. It's about the South Side of Chicago. It's about our neighborhood and community, and it's about bringing life to a park that, has, that may be protected <laughs> and loved by its friends, but it's not used by the community. It can serve as a catalyst to stitch together the economies of downtown Chicago and north side Chicago with south side Chicago and eventually west side Chicago. Here to talk about the latest Obama Presidential Center design just unveiled yesterday is the Chicago Tribune's Pulitzer Prize winning architecture critic Blair Kamen. Blair, great to see you as always. Good to see you, Paris. So what is different with this version that's just unveiled? What's different is that, well, it's version three, and what's different is that there are some nips and tucks and more glass and more sculpting. It's essentially the same contours. Uh, uh, this is the first version, the Egyptian right. pyramid version from 2017. This is version two with um, more uh, other, other features. It was taller, it had these uh, um, uh, windows with um, uh, letters, uh, screen-like windows with letters in the corner, and this is version three that we're seeing here. So what you're seeing is there, there are subtle things here. There are, there are little incisions in the corners that kind of make it more sculptural. The President Obama told the architects, Todd Williams and Billy Chen of New York, that he wanted it to be more welcoming. So you can see in the center on the far left, or pardon me, on the far right, that there's a very tall window, about 88 feet tall, that really says this is, this is a building you can come into. It's not a fortress. You can also see, um, uh, slices in the building up on the upper right hand corner and the lower in the middle left so the whole idea here is to make this is to try to make this an object um, that's more appealing um, to look at uh, because it's going to be a centerpiece in in Jackson Park those are the major things that change so you said this is version number three does that mean it's the final version or is there a, a more to be changed about this I think it's still a work in progress I hope it's still a work in progress I think that this uh, design is improved um, but I don't think it's there yet. 
By the way, the height is taller now. Why did they decide to do that? The height is taller from than version from, from one. Than version one. Right. Better proportions. Essentially, the first version was pretty squat. Uh, and uh, here you're seeing a, an image of the view from Stony Island. This is still pretty fortress-like uh, in my view. And uh, whereas this view facing south toward the plaza is much more appealing. There's a kind of majesty to it, a monumentality to it, but it doesn't look museum-like. You also see some very interesting features in the upper left-hand corner, for example, is that screen-like wall of letters that the architects say could be um, a quotation from one of Obama's unifying speeches. And I think that's very appropriate. I mean, that really could be a memorable feature of this uh, building, kind of really recalling the power of oratory and, uh, and in, Obama's, in Obama's career. To be clear, they haven't selected what quotation they want to use yet. No, no. There right. are red, there's uh, no red America. No red no states, red, no blue right. states, the United yeah. States. That Who might knows? be a finalist yeah. there. Oh, right, exactly. So you say this needs to be more inviting. Mm -hmm. can, a, can a big obelisk like this actually be inviting? What needs to happen to make it more inviting? Well, that's really up to the architects. In other words, I think they've done it on the, on the south side, uh, south facing side of the building. Um, I mean, just because, you know, it's a museum um, doesn't mean necessarily, I mean, museums generally don't have a lot of windows, right, because you want controlled light. And, um, you know, there are things you can do. Um, you know, we all go to the Art Institute, right, on Michigan Avenue. That doesn't have a lot of windows on its Michigan Avenue facade. Uh, and there it is. Um, but, you know, it's a classical language, it's temple-like, there's shade and shadow patterns. So those things kind of make us feel at home and want to enter that building. Um, so it's really up to the architects here, how are they gonna take this kind of abstract, modern language and say, you know, welcome. And this is a dynamic place, it's a forward-looking place, not a place that's looking backward to Greek temples and, and things like that. Curious uh, whether you have any insight as to how the Obamas have reacted to each of these designs. Well, clearly they want to change. In other words, uh, I mean, the architects have said at successive inter in successive interviews that, you know, the president said, right, make it more, you know, at first they came in with a design before even version one. Obama said, make it strong, make it I mean, it did they expect that obelisk design? I don't know if they expected it, but I think Obama said he wanted something strong. He wanted something powerful. So in part, that's what, you know, created a building that was, that wound up being 235 feet tall in Jackson Park, not a tiny little, you know, pavilion below the treetops. So yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any question that, you know, the most important architecture critic here isn't me, it's Barack Obama who wanted to be uh, an architect when he was a kid. Although you do have the architect's <laughs> ears from what I understand. So we've seen a lot of the exterior renderings. What about the interior? What is that gonna look like? Well, I mean, I think that's a really important question because one of the themes of this building is ascension, not just literal ascension, going up into a building that's 235 feet tall, but metaphoric ascension, the idea that, you know, uh, the Obamas represent an African-American ascension. So, I mean, you know, in this building, you're gonna have um, a very glassy lobby facing the plaza on the first floor. You're gonna go up into galleries that um, take you further up into the building where you're gonna view things like, you know, as Barack Obama joked, Michelle Obama's famous dresses and, and things like that, parts of his presidency good and, and perhaps bad. And then there's gonna be a, a sky lounge up on the top of the building that has you know, dramatic views of the lakefront, um, the University of Chicago, the downtown skyline. So, I mean, you know, if, if, imagine if you're a kid you know, who lives in Englewood and you don't have the dough to go to the Willis Tower sky deck. This is your sky deck and it's free, it's open to the public. So there's, I think that, you know, there's this physical uplift in the building that's really one of the, most promising parts of it. And people, you know, say, oh, it should just be a, you know, quiet presence in Jackson Park. Well, anyone who's been to the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. knows that um, an ascension moving upward is part of the great heartfelt, powerful story of that building. And, you know, I think the, the architects here really have a similar idea. Not exactly, um, but, you know, the idea is to really, um, is to create both an object, a beautiful icon in Jackson Park, and also a gathering place. And, um, 
this, you know, part of the gathering places is the Chicago Public Library branch that you just saw. Um, there also are um, views of the plaza that you're seeing here. So it's both a gathering place and an object. And as Michelle Obama rightly said, it's kind of like a, a declaration of a revival for the South Side. And in the big picture, that is really important to say, you know, the South Side's here, the South Side matters, we wanna uplift the South Side, and we're gonna do it in part with this building and the activities that go along with it. I just think that the object itself can be more beautiful. And if you're gonna put it in Jackson Park, Frederick Law Olmsted's Jackson Park on the National Register of Historic Places, it's gotta be perfect, and it isn't yet. And, and it's got some time here because there's still some federal reviews that have to be passed before right. they can break ground. That's right. Do you, do you have a sense of what this time frame is gonna be? Um, no, I mean, well, in general, yes. In other words, the federal review probably will be over sometime early next year. Hopefully they can have a groundbreaking soon after that. Um, and then it's going to take, you know, it's two and a half, three years to, to build it. So it's, it's, but there's time. And the Obamas have been great and the architects have been great about listening to the community, listening to critics, trying to make it better. They still have to work out things like a community benefits agreement. But I mean, I think that, you know, they're, they're really good clients, and I think that they and the architects hopefully can, you know, get this to the next level All right. uh, so it really belongs. Blair Kamen, we'll have you back at the, each successive level to, uh, to critique uh, those designs. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paris. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. We have a tremendous source of untapped, efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. Now to some other news in Chicago tonight. The CEO of Chicago-based Boeing was on Capitol Hill today testifying before a Senate committee. Dennis Muhlenberg was hit with a barrage of questions about the company's 737 MAX jet, which was involved in fatal crashes this year and last, killing 346 people. Muhlenberg apologized to family members of victims, many of whom were in attendance at the hearing, and he acknowledged mistakes made by Boeing. We've been challenged and changed by these accidents. We've made mistakes and we got some things wrong. We're improving and we're learning and we're continuing to learn. Starbucks says it's investing $10 million in Chicago's community lenders to drive economic opportunity in the city. The coffee giant will soon open a mammoth four-story Starbucks Reserve roastery on Michigan Avenue. Location is touted as the company's third such store in the U.S. and the largest in the world. Starbucks says today's investment announcement will finance more than 500 loans to help grow small businesses and create jobs in Chicago's underserved communities. And Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox has a new employee. Her name is Hattie, and she's the office's first support dog. She'll help kids and mentally disabled victims of sexual assault and violence as they testify in court. Hattie, which is short for hat trick, was sworn in today after a 45-day training period. Illinois passed legislation in 2016 that allows state prosecutors to petition the court to have a support dog present when children or mentally disabled persons are testifying in court on sexual assault cases. And as for the weather, a chance for some rain and perhaps even a little snow tonight with a low around 36. And then tomorrow, expect more rain with a high near 40. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, Google says this odd-looking computer has achieved quantum supremacy. Why that could be a game changer. Actor and performer John Leguizamo on his one-man show, Latin History for Morons, playing in Chicago this week. A former Chicago Sun-Times managing editor discusses her new book about women in journalism. And growers present pumpkins, some weighing more than half a ton, at a giant pumpkin way-off in the Chicago area. But first, some of today's top business headlines from Cranes. Here's Stephanie Goldberg. Thanks, Paris. 
Grubhub says the online food ordering and delivery business is slowing. The Chicago-based company missed analyst expectations for sales and profit in the latest quarter, and it didn't offer guidance for the coming year. Shares fell about 40 percent this afternoon to around $33. In a letter to investors, Grubhub says new customers are less loyal in that they're not ordering as often as diners used to in markets like Chicago and New York. Meanwhile, the real estate firm redeveloping the old post office has added more than $100 million of debt to the project after a leasing hot streak. They'll spend the money to accelerate rehabbing more of the space. Since its original $500 million construction loan, 601W has leased up most of the building at a faster rate than it thought it would. The project is set to open its doors later this week. Finally, Zebra Technologies has landed a contract with the U.S. Postal Service worth more than half a billion dollars. The Lincolnshire-based maker of barcode scanners will supply more than 300,000 of the handheld devices to the Postal Service, which is grappling with the real-time demands of e-commerce and competitors like FedEx and UPS. The deal is valued at $570 million. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Stephanie Goldberg. Back to you, Paris. Thanks, Stephanie. In the world of computer technology, it has been described as akin to the Wright brothers launching their first flight. Last week, tech giant Google announced it has a computer that's achieved quantum supremacy. Google says its computer took a problem that a normal supercomputer would take 10,000 years to solve and figured it out in just over three minutes. So what might this brave new world of quantum technology deliver? Joining us to now to help understand that Google achievement and the broader potential impact of this technology is David Aushalam, director of the Chicago Quantum Exchange and a leading scientist in the world of quantum technologies. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. Thank you for having me here. All right, David Aushalam, quantum supremacy sounds like a kind of an ominous thing. What exactly does that mean? It does sound ominous, and we'd like to think about it more as quantum advantage. Now, will this new technology solve a problem that's beyond the reach of any of our supercomputers today or any, any extrapolation? of a computer we could build in the future. And tell us um, why a quantum computer, as, as Google says it just tested, is more powerful than a regular conventional computer. That's a great question. And ultimately, it's because of the way these quantum bits, much like our transistors today, these quantum bits, how they connect with one another, how they're wired to each other, that technology enables you to perform calculations that are much more expansive. And a nice example is in your smartphone or your laptop, you have a few hundred million transistors. But imagine a quantum computer with just 300 of these quantum bits or quantum transistors. That 300-bit quantum machine can store more in numbers than the number of atoms in the observable universe. And that's quite a lot. That uh, is quite a lot. As, as I understand. So then how impactful is this discovery by Google where, where this quantum computer solved this very complicated problem that would take yeah. 10,000 years for a regular computer to solve, did it in three minutes? Well, yeah, for quantum advantage, we'd like to think about this as can a machine solve a meaningful problem? And I think what's important here is it's an incredibly impressive technological achievement. And it plants a flag on the roadmap for a lot of us. It's a chance to look at this machine, look at the experiment, try and see what we can learn from it. Can we do better the next time around? And it's going to start a roadmap to build more and more powerful quantum machines. It's quite important. And it was a kind of a random problem that uh, Google asked this computer to solve. So what's the practical application of quantum computing? What kind of problems in the real world can it solve? Well, the nice thing about quantum computing, of course, we don't ultimately know the answer, but it can solve problems complex like molecular structure. How do proteins work? You know, one of the mysteries, for example, in us is how do our proteins function? And these quantum bits connected together can solve chemical uh, systems and chemical configurations in ways we can't do today. Even understanding the caffeine molecule is a challenging one for today's computers. I understand enough about caffeine. It yeah, makes, sure. makes you more alert, sure. maybe. But also, each of these quantum bits, if you turn it around and expose it to the world, is a type of sensor. Mm -hmm. And quantum sensors also have a huge uh, impact in today's technology. For example, imagine taking magnetic resonance imaging to the level of a single molecule. Mm -hmm. And today, when you're in a hospital and you get an MRI scan, you're looking at billions and billions of them. So MRI scans cannot get down to that quantum no. level at this point. But if you could, you could imagine looking, for example, at the structure function relationship of one protein, or detecting cancer at the level of a single cell, you know, or turning these quantum sensors outwards, you know, looking at events in the galaxy. People are now creating ideas for telescopes that could look for civilizations on planets across the galaxy. 
So you the quantum, quantum technology could, could sort of advance that kind of research. Absolutely, and that's the exciting thing about this field right now. It's going in all of these different directions, computing, sensing, and even communication, building on hackable networks. And this is sort of the, the new school that opened at the University of Chicago. The molecular uh, engineering is, is basically dealing with all of this, isn't it? So one of the thrust areas in this new school is, uh, in fact, a new program in quantum engineering. Because one of the things a lot of us are worried about, when this technology appears, where will the quantum engineers appear? Mm -hmm. Who's going to train the next generation of leaders in this field? And, um, and that's what led to the Chicago Quantum Exchange, actually here in the city. Right, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. I want to go back to quantum computing for a second. Is this something that's going to be available to the general public uh, in terms of a quantum computing phone or a, or a tablet mm. or a computer? Mm. Well, in a way, it already is. So companies like IBM have put uh, quantum computers in the cloud. And they already have hundreds of thousands of users using these machines, trying to do, well, experimenting with them to learn what you can do and what you can't do. So that's happening right now. And this is the, uh, the Google quantum computer, kind of funny looking device. Why does it look like that? So this particular technology that Google and IBM have chosen to uh, push into the world uses superconductors. So these quantum bits are based on circulating currents that have to run for a very long time with very little resistance. And for that to happen, you have to cool these materials to temperatures just above absolute zero. So what you're looking at is a refrigerator, a very special refrigerator that cools to a milli-degree, just mm. above zero uh, temperature to keep these systems very clean and running well. Wow. Um, there is a potential downside to quantum computing in terms of people's security, online security, passwords, credit cards, things like that. Can you explain that? Well, actually, it's an upside. I mean, one of the interesting things about quantum information and about quantum science in general is the act of looking at something changes it. So you mm -hmm. might think that's a problem. The act of looking at it changes it. Correct. So if you have a quantum bit and you don't carefully protect it, if you look at it, you change it. It's a little bit like if I put an electron in a box and I tried to find it. And I gave you a flashlight. Can you tell me why that happens? Yeah, it's one of the fundamental properties of quantum physics, mm -hmm. which is the act of looking will change. So, you know, for example, if you've shown light on a particle, when the light hits the particle, it's moved. Mm -hmm. So if I put it in a box and I asked you to find it, it would be pretty hard the act of looking would move it. So one of the tenets of quantum science is the act of looking changes. So that, you might think, is a liability for a technology, but for security, it's fantastic. If I send you a message, mm -hmm. and you want to be sure you've received it, you want to be sure no one's eavesdropped. And if an eavesdropper looks, they change it. Hmm. So if you built a global quantum network based on sending quantum states around the world, you have built-in security. So the risks are equaled out by, by the potential benefits. You just mentioned the uh, quantum exchange of which you and the UFC are a part of. Uh, explain uh, what kind of work you're doing with the quantum exchange. Yeah, so the quantum exchange is uh, housed in Hyde Park in the Pritzker School for Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. And it's a confederation of Argonne National Laboratory, University of Chicago, Fermi National Lab, and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, uh, as well as Northwestern University and the University of Wisconsin and about a dozen industrial partners. And we're lucky here in Illinois that we have two major national laboratories. And taken together, this is a group of well over 100 quantum scientists and engineers that can work together on grand challenges in quantum science and technology. Certainly a lot of talent in this region in that area. David Oshalam, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. And we're back with some Latin history from a notable actor right after this. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. If your Latin history is a little rusty, actor and writer John Leguizamo understands and he's here to offer an antidote in the form of his latest one-man show playing in Chicago this week. Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg has more. Tonight's lesson is... Latin history for morons, and that's you. We morons have been getting schooled by John Leguizamo's latest one-man show, first on Broadway, then a Netflix special, now a national tour. The idea for the show came when Leguizamo realized his son's eighth grade history textbooks were utterly lacking in Latin history. His own research led to one book after another. And it was this plethora of information that I was like, wait a minute. It, all, the, all this incredible information, and it's not in history textbooks or Hollywood movies or History Channel, something's up. And, and, it, it, and that's why I wrote the show. 
Who would have thought that colonization could be so much fun? The show covers thousands of years' worth of material. Like Wazamo says, he's gotten bolder about adding information over the years. That first when I started doing it, I had a lot of history, and people were like, nah, no. And I was like, come on. And they're like, no, no. So I had a, like, you know, a little personal story, a little analogous story, and then a little history and back and forth. Now I put a little more history in, snuck it in a little better. While the role of history teacher is a recent one, Leguizamo's long been known for a wide range of roles. An upstart drug dealer in Carlito's Way. Hey, remember me? Benny Blanco from the Bronx? <laughs> Fledgling drag queen Chichi Rodriguez in the cult hit To Wong Fu. We were so poor, my parents got married for the rice, you know? So and while many younger viewers know his voice as Sid the Sloth from Ice Age, I gotcha! Leguizamo says kids usually find it hard to believe when their parents tell them that's who he is. They're aghast. Yeah. <laughs> I go, I know, this is Sid the Sloth. Get over it. Leguizamo says probably his favorite performance was his previous one-man show, Ghetto Clown. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Dan. I'm sorry that I always let you down. No, no, mijo, it's not you, it's me. I gotta get used to your failures. It's the most intimate or raw you can be as an artist with an audience. When they're outraged by things, because I feel it, when they're saddened by what I'm talking about, when they're laughing their asses off. For 50 years, my mom's been serving leftovers, and to this day, no one's ever found the original meal. The show is infused with Leguizamo's humor, and it's informed in part by the current political moment. The fact that we're 20% of the population, but less than 3% of the faces in front of the cameras in Hollywood or behind the cameras that the, uh, is, is a cultural apartheid that predated Trump. The only thing is that it's made it important for me to make it a, a call to action. And it does affect the way I do the show. Definitely my show has a lot more teeth and a lot more oomph to it than when I first started. Leguizamo's hope for the show is pretty simple. I want everybody to walk out knowing that being Latin is a superpower. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. Latin History for Morons premieres tonight and runs through Sunday at the Cadillac Palace Theater. Our next guest is somewhat of a pioneer in the news business. She entered in 1978 after several landmark gender discrimination lawsuits in the 1970s forced newsrooms to make room for women. She eventually became managing editor at newspapers across the country, including the Chicago Sun-Times in the mid-90s. And now she's sharing stories of women's challenges trying to advance in what has historically been a male-dominated industry. It's all in a new book called There's No Crying in Newsrooms, What Women Have Learned About What It Takes to Lead. And co-author Julia Wallace joins us now. She also teaches the business of journalism at Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Welcome to Chicago Night. Thank Welcome you. back to it's Chicago. It's great to be here. It's a little cold, though. It's a little cold. All right, so when you entered uh, in the late 70s, tell us what the climate was like for women in the news business. It was tough. Um, they didn't want us in newsrooms. It, they were all white. They were all male. And so there was a bit of a... I don't know, hazing almost. Um, women weren't allowed to wear pants. They weren't, I, I was actually the first woman to smoke in the Rock Island Argus newsroom because they thought it was unladylike for women to smoke. But even men though, smoked. Of course, men smoked. Um, you know, we weren't allowed to cover certain stories. Certain beats were considered off limits. There was sexual harassment all around. It was, it was tough and not that different than a lot of other all male industries where women walked in beginning it, in the seventies. And you actually got the direction that you couldn't cry in the newsroom. Thus Absolutely. The title. Everybody has a story about, you have to be tough. The fact is you had to show that you were tougher than them and you weren't going to be bullied. And so crying was part of that. If you cried, it just showed weakness. And so everyone got the advice. Some woman would take you aside and say, don't ever let them see you cry. So you led many newspapers, the Chicago Sun-Times in the mid-90s. What was it like leading that paper? Because Chicago has been known for its share of male characters yes. in this business. So what was that experience for you? Um, it was wonderful, actually. I mean, the, you know, we have a lot of crazy stories that we tell in the book, um, and you sort of can't believe those things happen. But the other piece of it wouldn't change it for anything. I mean, being part of Chicago journalism, I, I grew up on the Sun-Times. I love the Sun-Times. To have a chance to work there as a managing editor was dream come true. We did a lot of great work, including a big investigative piece into uh, Dan Rostenkowski and uh, that 
resulted in some troubles for him. Um, just, it was a great experience. And I think for, for the women who really make it to the top, you, you sort of, you figure out how to be resilient. You can't let, let it bother you and you just sort of got to plow through it. And so in this book, you interview close to 100 women. Yes. Uh -huh. One of them is PBS NewsHour anchor Judy Woodruff. What insights did you gain uh, from her? Judy's the best, first of all. Judy is one of the most amazing journalists around and lucky to have her on PBS NewsHour. So she tells a really interesting story. Um, so she applied for jobs in Atlanta in the, it would have been in the uh, late 60s. And one place is like, I'm sorry, we already have our woman reporter. You can't work here. And she couldn't find a job as a reporter. So she ended up beginning as a secretary and having to sort of wash floors, clean up studios, whatever it took to sort of get her foot in the door. And she basically would work nights, work overtime, whatever she could to begin her reporting experience. And so, you know, she was, a, she was one of the first women in the White House. Um, there's a funny story about um, when she had, when she had a, was pregnant, they refused, to, they didn't want to show her, so they only showed her from like the head up while she was pregnant. Wait, so where no was one... she working at this point? She, uh, good question. Well, she was at one of the networks She was at CNN. one of the networks, I forget which one, not CNN, but I think it was one of the networks. Um, and um, maybe NBC, I think it was NBC. And then, um, so they're only showing from the head up, and then after the baby's born, they actually showed a photo of her with the baby on air, and it was the uh, anchor at the time, uh, was saying this is so unusual because we've never shown a baby like this. So she was a real pioneer. Absolutely. And, and so as you mentioned in the book, things gradually got better for women, but the curve hasn't been no. a, a straight line up. Tell us why it's still a struggle right now. So what's interesting is in, a, in the 2000s, there were actually more women editors of news, top newspapers than there are today. Um, Anne-Marie Lipinski was the editor of the Chicago Tribune for a number of years, and she created a group called the Large Ladies Group, and we would meet once a year, and it was the editors of large newspapers around the country and sort of talk about, you know, the shared issues and various things. And um, there were a dozen or so of us that were involved now, if you did that, three or four. And what, what accounts for that? So I think it's about um, the economic challenges that the industry has faced. I think the industry was committed to putting women, people of color, making sure that we had newsrooms that reflected our communities. And then in 2008, the recession hits, and everyone's like, oh, we gotta forget everything. We gotta focus on the biz saving the business. And it stopped being a priority. And at the same time, according to your book, there are more women entering journalism school than uh -huh. men, is that correct? Absolutely. So in newsroom, in journalism schools today, two thirds, three quarters of the graduates are women, and they begin in the business, but they often leave. Um, they leave in their 30s. They leave in their 40s. Um, and like a lot of industries, they get disillusioned. They are expecting a fair playing field, and instead they find, you know, that they're not paid as well. They're not given the same opportunities. Um, there've been a, McKinsey just came out with a study last week of uh, women in the workplace in general, not just in media and shows that even for that first supervisory job, women don't, aren't given the same opportunities as men. And in the, in the book, you close each chapter with some advice for women. Yes. So give us a sample of what you tell some of your women students sure. who are about to enter the business. So um, resiliency is number one. I mean, it's persistence and resiliency. Uh, you know, if you're gonna get upset when somebody says no to you, I mean, and this is true for men and women. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the advice applies to men Absolutely. too, right? <laughs> you know, it's like if you're gonna if you're gonna get upset every time someone says no to you, you're in trouble. So you've got to be persistent, and you got to sort of be resilient about that. I think the other is about the issue of being your sort of authentic self. Mm -hmm. That for women, the range of leadership is much narrower than men. If a man's tough, you can get away with it. If a woman's too tough, she's called the B word. The dreaded B word, yes. right. You know, if a, if a man's soft and nurturing, that's sort of appealing. If a woman's too soft and nurturing, oh, she's just seen as a pushover, right? So women have a much narrower area in which they can operate and be successful, but you still gotta be true to yourself. One woman that you, inter a woman that you interviewed in here, Gretchen Carlson, yeah. her story has been out there in miniseries and in books and movies. She, of course, was the Fox News anchor yeah. uh, that blew the whistle on Roger Ailes, their longtime controversy uh, chairman. Uh, tell us what she told you about her experience. So she was so interesting to me because we focused a chapter on sexual harassment and if you had said 
said, who do you think is going to be likely to begin this whole change in how we think about sexual harassment? I'm not sure anybody would have expected it was Gretchen Carlson, mm. right? I'm here, former Miss America. And, but she just sort of got to the point where she said is enough is enough. She felt, you know, she obviously felt she was harassed and she decided that she wasn't going to take it. And so she secretly taped Roger Ailes saying some things that were pretty inappropriate that forced them to, uh, Fox, to, to fire him. And, you know, she said that at the time she didn't realize that she was starting a movement, mm. which, you know, I, I give her a lot of credit for, but wouldn't have done it any other way. I'm curious, I, I should important. ask you about issues in the news. Uh, what do you make of what's happening at NBC where, as reported in Ronan Farrow's book, the, the, the president there uh, made lots of women sign non-disclosure agreements. So I think it's going to be really interesting now that they're releasing these women to see what we learn. Um, you know, these non-disclosure agreements have been a problem for years. I mean, part of the reason these people were able to be serial sexual predators is because of these non-disclosure agreements. And so the sooner we don't have those and we figure out a way that we can shed light and sort of open up the door so, so that these people can't continue to prey on people, the better. All right, Julia Wallace, thank you very much. Thank and congratulations you. on the book. Thank you. So nice to be with you. Nice to be with you, too. And again, the book is called There's No Crying in Newsrooms, What Women Have Learned About What It Takes to Lead. And you can read an excerpt on our website. Giant pumpkins are pretty special. The oversized fruits are derived from a specific seed variety called Dill's Atlantic Giant. These pumpkins can put on 30 to 50 pounds per day during the peak summer season. Some growers get quite competitive when weighing their prized pumpkins. We recently traveled about 60 miles southwest of Chicago to document a giant pumpkin way off and brought you this story. Here's another look. Hi, I'm Kevin Heap, and uh, welcome to Heap's Giant Pumpkin Farm. Uh, we're having a giant pumpkin way off. It's gonna take place here in just a little bit. Our farm's probably right at 160 years old or so, and we started growing pumpkins, I bet, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, and uh, we grow right at 26 and a half acres of pumpkins. Oh, it's really cool. What can't you not like about giant pumpkins? How cool is that? The time it takes to grow these things is incredible. If we're weighing smallest to biggest based on just size uh, measurements. Yeah, basically I founded this um, with a bunch of local growers about 15 years ago. So in Illinois, there's probably maybe 10 to 15 serious competitive growers, um, and that varies year to year. It's a tough hobby, so a lot of people, they'll drop out after a couple years if there's not success. I mean, there's no guarantees when it comes to growing giant pumpkins. This is maybe half of what the world record would be. You know, this is half of a 2,000 pound pumpkin. Yeah. Top price is, uh, $500, plus we have a traveling uh, championship belt that goes to the champion. The heaviest weight on this belt is 1861 in 2016 from Joe. I've always loved pumpkins ever since I was little. You go to the pumpkin patch and even when I was a little kid I had to get the biggest pumpkin that they would have out there so as you get older you just realize you can't find those in the store you got to grow them yourself and it's just turned out to be this. You wouldn't really want to eat one of these type of pumpkins. Usually those little tiny sugar pie pumpkins are the ones that you eat with. Um, the other thing is too, some of the stuff that the growers put in there, I don't think I'd want to be eating it. I mean, I make pumpkin pies out of like the carving, so I hack up the face. Uh, I'll make about a dozen pies for uh, Thanksgiving for family and friends. Yeah, no, they're good. They're good eating. Uh, we're down to the two last competitors, mine and Joe's, um, for the biggest. So I got my pumpkin and Joe's is strapped up. I was shooting for 1300, but you can't get too greedy. <laughs> 
that's pumping to be weight is mine, and uh, 1258 is the weight to beat. So we're gonna see here in a minute. What's, what's yeah. going down? <laughs> Getting down to the nitty gritty. It all comes down to the nitty gritty. That's it. It's down. crunch time, baby. It's crunch time. <laughs> Here we go. That's it. It is. It is what it is. What are you gonna do? So I lost by 50 pounds. On a good day, that's one good day growing in July or August. And Joe gets another year with the belt. That's it. That's it, baby. We live Fair? in Chicago. There's always next year. That's it. It's, 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 it's fair and square. And in case you were wondering, the world record for heaviest pumpkin was set in 2016 by a Belgian grower. He grew a pumpkin weighing 2,624 pounds. Visit our website to learn more about the giant pumpkin growing and check out a comprehensive list of Chicago area pumpkin patches, many of which are closing this week. And that is our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast in the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Teacher talks have gone round the clock. Will kids be back in school this week? And sister Helen Prejean on the journey that brought Dead Man Walking from a memoir to a movie to the Lyric Opera of Chicago. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.